Once people see that, that these are essentially decentralized businesses that operate and sell block space, people start to understand that what's unique about this infrastructure layer, it's the first infrastructure layer in history that we can all participate in because of the behavioral incentives of a token system versus equity. And so when I look at it, I just look at the growth of the space and it grows at a hundred and something percent a year, which is twice the speed of the internet because obviously it's built on internet rails, which should go quickly. And I just extrapolate that trend out and I look at it and it's like, well, it's a two and a half trillion dollar space today. If we carry on by 2032, it's a hundred trillion. I'm like, that's the largest accumulation of wealth in all human history in the shortest period of time. Even if I'm wrong by 50% because I'm a total moron, it's the same as a hundred years of value accrual of the S&P 500 in eight years. Right. It's, It's bananas. It's because we can own this adoption layer and all of these businesses selling block space. That's all it's about. Best thing is just try and capture that growth first. If you're going to do anything in the space, stop trying to focus on the one thing. Just capture two and a half trillion to a hundred trillion. You'll be absolutely fine. The cryptocurrency space is expanding at an unprecedented pace, offering what many see as the greatest wealth creation opportunity in human history. In a recent interview, Raul Pal, CEO of Real Vision, predicted that the cryptocurrency market, currently valued at $2.5 trillion, could reach $100 trillion by 2032. This represents a 50x increase and would mark the largest accumulation of wealth in the shortest period ever. Even if Powell's estimate is off by 50%, it would still match the growth of the S&P 500 over 100 years in just eight years, which is astonishing. I've explained this to people a lot. I don't care what people's philosophies are. That's not how you make money. What you make money on is owning the best performing asset on a risk-adjusted basis. So what I tend to find is that the mid to upper part of the curve, which is networks gaining adoption, do best. ETH last cycle, Solana this cycle, and whoever it's going to be this cycle, whether it's Sui or whether it's Nier or whatever it is, I don't know. We will see that, right? That is the easiest opportunity we get in the space to generate wealth so firstly focus on that that's the like do not fuck this up thesis if we're going from two and a half trillion to a hundred trillion do that and you'll make a lot of money yeah um and so then i just filter out as many people as possible i really only get signal from a few people that i'll ever listen to if you tweet something i'll always read what you tweet because i think you'll have a high signal to noise ratio most people are high noise to signal ratio and so I'll observe it, the sentiment and any nuggets, but I, I try and filter out as much as possible and just stick with, unless something shows that network adoption is slowing, I'm right. So just capture that. Right. Then I don't FOMO in the rest. I just don't do it. So I don't spread. I did that last cycle. I tried to spread about this narrative, that narrative. And what I do now is really simple. It's, it's idiot proof. I just put the chart against Solana. If something yeah. looks like it's a sustained trend against Solana, I'll allocate some capital to it. And again, only about 10% of my portfolio will I do in that kind of stuff. But you can make a lot of money in those. And so, yeah. you know, that's what got me into Whiff and Bonk because they were out of form with Solana. So I'm like, okay, I can do that. And now, you know, if anybody shills me something, I just say, well, show me the chart outperforming Solana and I'll take a look. Um, Right. That discipline makes it ultra easy for me because I think because of this everything code liquidity cycle, everything is correlated, every asset in the world, which makes it the, and it's all driven by the same debt refi cycle, which makes it, I think, the easiest macro risk taking environment of all time. Because the central banks have also taken the left tail out by saying we can't let a collateral fall too far. So we will debase currency. Holy shit, if this is the case then we have the simplest, easiest risk-taking opportunity of all time. So hyper-concentrate, I think, is is the way. Now, there are people who can do the tail part, hyper-concentrate and get it right. But the probability is lower, and then you, you break the first rule, which is don't fuck this up. Because if you get taken right. out in the cycle and lose your capital, and this cycle is going from two and a half trillion to a hundred trillion, you, that's bad. I always try and Simplify, simplify, simplify. And I've got it down to this. This is the underlying... It's it's the new underlying infrastructure for the internet, as we've talked about. And people get confused. When I go around 
uh, marketing our thunder funds, people get confused still is, but there's this Bitcoin narrative, this, this narrative, that narrative. And I'm like, stop. These are all decentralized businesses that sell block space. And they have different qualities to their block space or a different narrative on what makes their block spaces um, effective. And that is, once people see that, that these are essentially decentralized businesses that operate and sell block space, people start to understand that what's unique about this infrastructure layer, it's the first infrastructure layer in history that we can all participate in because of the behavioral incentives of a token system versus equity. And so when I look at it, I just look at the growth of the space and it grows up a hundred and something percent a year, which is twice the speed of the internet because obviously it's built on internet rails, which so should go quickly. And I just extrapolate that trend out and I look at it and it's like, well, it's a two and a half trillion dollar space today. If we carry on by 2032, it's a hundred trillion. I'm like, that's the largest accumulation of wealth in all human history in the shortest period of time. Even if I'm wrong by yeah. 50% because I'm a total moron, it's the same as a hundred years of value accrual of the S&P 500 in eight years. Right. It's it's bananas. It's because we can own this adoption layer and all of these businesses selling block space. That's all it's about. And best thing is just try and capture that growth first. If you're going to do anything in the space, stop trying to focus on the one thing. Just capture two and a half trillion to a hundred trillion. You'll be right. absolutely fine. From a pure investment perspective, I get it. A bit of lower volatility will produce great outcomes. I.e., the applications layer can build properly. You know, we've got time to test stuff and everything's not driven by price. But I don't think the financial nihilism is going away because it can't. It's like the average 35-year-old, 30-year-old is so screwed that they really don't have a choice. If they don't do this, they're just going to go on poly markets or they're going to go to the lottery. Well, lotteries for boomers, they're just going to poly markets. You can't stop it now because... They don't have the upside. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think the attention of speculation and the dream of wealth just keeps doing it. You know, it's that whole, I need to unfuck my future idea that I talk about. That's so pervasive. So I, I, I think it's difficult for it to go away out, out of crypto. And if it is the big opportunity, who are us to say to people, well, you can't drive the next leg of it. So here's another thought that I'm thinking through. You're, it's, based a, a little bit around your idea of a longer cycle. And again, I think this is probably more likely from technology stocks than crypto, but I think it probably applies, is I think one of the paths of most pain is 2026, liquidity gets drawn out of the system a bit. It's not 2022 all over again. People have PTSD. Why does a Bitcoin only goes down 40%? Right. And the NASDAQ goes down 20 And totally. then... And then we then we go into a bubble cycle. Because if you think of the AI narrative, the robotics narrative, the EV narrative, I mean, these are all combining into one super narrative, right? This exponential age idea is is going to be ridiculous. And I think this is going to be the last pause that we get before we really go into complete banana zone for everything. And my, my actual risk is all the people who come out of the market don't get back in again because they can't. Right. Right. Yes. God, that would be brutal. <laughs> you can see why, Maybe. right? Because everyone's now like, I get it. It goes at 85%. It's a free gift. I'll take this every time. I'll make yeah. my 20x and move on. What well, If you don't get that, you might still get your 20x because of a bubble cycle, but you, you won't get in because you're still totally. waiting. One thing I do notice with the Everything Code is, yes, there's a lot of people who kind of understand it, but there's a lot of people in total disbelief. People just say it can't be this easy. Like, huh. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. And if it's not until everybody believes in it that then it's more likely to be super wrong. Um, right. Hearing the opposite opinions, you know most of them are just not very grounded opinions. They tend to be from you know, the peanut gallery about, well, inflation's coming back and it's going to be the 70s over again or whatever. The now you, you can kind of discount all of that stuff unless somebody has a reasonable argument in a way that why liquidity wouldn't come back, how they could allow the debt to refinance. The only way for me is somehow GDP growth has to magically, trend rate has to change. And that can't happen, I don't think, 
till about 2030 when the AI and you know the infinite population of AI and robots kicks in and productivity from lower electricity prices and all of this. I'm like, I just, you know, unless you can show me one of those things that's that's uh, going to change the game right now, I can't see it changing. What I've learned over the years is if I have a core investing amount to this theme, I'm just not going to take it out. And then it removes yeah. all of this. So my entire objective is to buy the sell-off. So it kind of shifts your focus because you know the highs are lower and the, the, the lows are higher and the highs are higher. So you actually just compound. If you want to keep it really stress-free, you just say, I can't wait for the next 85% correction when it comes in 2026 because I can buy more at cheap prices and you keep compounding. The hard thing is last time around was difficult because most people's earnings were coming down. But generally speaking, you get a bit of a slowdown. But generally, if you can just inject new earnings in, you will just compound well, which is why Bezos and all these guys are the richest people in the world because they take one bet and never got out of it. And people, yeah. I see this, people are now desperate because they understand there's a cycle to trade this thing. So my particular view is don't use price, use time. If you want to take some lifestyle chips off, you want to buy a new house and buy a new car, whatever it is, take some off at the end of this year at whatever price. And then you can run the rest. So then I try and break it down probabilistically is, okay, what does the structure of this cycle look like? Just out of interest, really. And and I this is what I'm using Signal from on Twitter. It's just trying to listen to everybody. People are insanely fearful of the short, stunted cycle, end of the cycle last time. Yeah. And I remember the 2017 top and how banal as that was. And the 2013. Yeah. And like 2013, 2017 were much more similar than the last one. And don't forget, we'd gone through a global pandemic. There was a lot of other factors at play. So I'm like, that was probably the outlier. Don't expect everything to repeat perfectly. But like you, I'm probabilistically saying, well, it just probably goes to the end of the year. My macro work on liquidity says liquidity peaks out, just peaks out, not goes negative or does anything else. It's just, peaks out by about June or July. So of 25. Of 25. So, but I'm seeing Twitter just tie itself in knots about that fear of the, the last stage part. And so they, they desperately want to s- sell earlier. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. so scared of it that they want to sell earlier, which makes me think 2000 and. 13 cycle feels more similar where everyone's going to try and take profit. The market goes down and then rips in your face again because it's not over right. yet. So there's right. a lot to play for here. You know, could it just finish in, in March or something? That would be really odd. The short cycle, I think that's off the table. A slightly stunted cycle, I think is PTSD. I think your intuition is right. It's like, well, it's finished the end of the year every time. The everything code is the same debt fit refinance cycle. Why necessarily would it change? Because as you pointed yeah. out before, the end of a bull market is not about liquidity, it's about flows. Yeah. So totally. the end of the bull well, market is where it, it kind of disconnects because it's it's the, all of those people who stupidly didn't get in when we've been begging them for the last two years. That's when they, they make their mistake.